Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, great to have you all in, in this session. My name is Carolina Trivelli. I'm a, a member of the Advisory Council of uh, PEI. I'm also uh, working at the Regional Office of FAO for Latin America presently, and I'm a board member of Busada Center for Behavioral Economics. So, uh, several of my topics are today in this uh, session. Um, I'm very glad to be here and I will be moderating the session if my internet allows it because I'm outside of Lima where I live and I don't have a very good connection. So if something goes wrong, uh, Janet will jump in and, and do the moderation, but we'll try to do it. Uh, and I will be turning off my camera so uh, to increase the livelihood of having a good connection. So let's begin. Thank you all for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, we are really looking forward to hearing the lessons that will emerge from today's diverse array, array of experiences and to having an engaging and interactive session. So please, uh, I ask you, I invite you to introduce yourself in the chat box and uh, start asking questions to the speakers through that channel. You can use the chat box to send a comment or a question uh, at any time during the session. Uh, these questions will be answered throughout the session, so we will be uh, feeding this, these questions to all the presenters. We have uh, interpretation to Arabic, French, Portuguese, and Spanish, so please go ahead and choose the language of your preference. Uh, you can do so by clicking the globe uh, icon at, at the Zoom uh, platform in the bottom of your screen. So please, if you have any uh, technical issues with the interpretation, please go ahead and send us a message through the chat box. Um, so let's begin. Let's begin. I will be uh, moderating the session and I'll give you some background information, especially for the ones of you that are new to this uh, PEI Open House webinar series. This is a monthly event gathered global, uh, that gathers global and country experts and on strategic thinking around economic inclusion programming and innovations across countries. This is the fourth session of the Open House series which will be focusing on the potential that behavioral science can have in enhancing economic inclusion programming. This open house is organized by PEI and co-hosted with Ideas42, a nonprofit organization that uses insights from, beh from behavioral sciences to improve lives, build better systems and policies and drive social change. We are happy to be featuring a rich set of country experiences from the World Bank's social protection and jobs uh, from Tanzania and Ghana, as well as rich insights from the world of academia. We encourage everybody to see our live tweet to, uh, at the, as these events goes at, uh, at, at PEI Global uh, Org. And just wanted to reiterate that the Open House Initiative is for all of you. So please share your thoughts and questions on the chat box. They are more than welcome. So let's begin. Let's begin this Open House with the main topic. How do economic inclusion programs can benefit and have benefited already from introducing behavioral insights into the design and implementation of these programs? And where are the evidence gaps and the future directions for the field? Those are the main questions that will be driving our main discussion. This discussion is timely as the world slowly recovers from the historical shock of COVID-19. The need to increase the cost effectiveness of programs for governments as economic inclusion scales up is a priority given the constraints of the uh, fiscal space. Understanding human behavior, how beneficiaries make or avoid making decisions is key to optimizing the program's results and participants' actions in each step. Just to be clear and to set the stage for the upcoming discussions, by economic inclusion programs, we mean programs that provide 
a bundle of coordinated multidimensional interventions that support poor and vulnerable households and communities in increasing their incomes and assets, building a pathway out of poverty. Although uh, the field of behavioral science is still a nascent stages, the multidimensional nature of economic inclusion programs can certainly leverage behavior insights that can simplify participants' requirements and incentivize better outcomes. Today's discussion will review how behavioral science can add value in this type of interventions by looking at the interaction between context and the human mind and the solutions that can be found by utilizing behavioral nudges. So let's begin. We, I'm happy to introduce our first speaker to set the stage, Kate McClear, uh, Senior Associate from Ideas for Ideas 42 and her frame and presentation. Uh, Kate, the floor is yours. Great, thanks so much. Um, so I hope everyone can see my screen now. Um, and I'll get started. Um, so thanks so much for the introduction. My name is Kate McLeod. I'm a senior associate at Ideas42. Um, and I will be talking about what behavioral science is and how it relates to economic inclusion programming. Um, so as Carolina outlined, economic inclusion programs are a bundle of coordinated interventions that support individuals, households, and communities to increase their incomes and assets. Um, but there are bottlenecks that can be addressed to optimize these programs. Um, and behavioral interventions so far have been effective in improving cash transfer programs um, and work is now being done to determine how it can improve impacts of other aspects of these big push economic inclusion programs. Um, so I'll start uh, by just talking a bit about what is behavioral science. Um, so behavioral science is the study of how humans make decisions and take actions in the real world. And it can help us understand a host of issues that impact all programs that rely on human behavior. Um, so this is what we would call the standard economic model of human behavior. Um, we would assume that everybody weighs the benefits and costs when making a decision. Um, they then make their decision. An action follows directly from the decision and the outcome follows naturally from that action. So it sounds pretty simple. Um, but in reality, we know that it's not that simple. Um, there are actually a number of other factors that matter. So when we're making the decision, we might be inundated with huge amounts of information and we can't pay attention to all of it. Um, so we often don't clearly weigh the costs and benefits. We might look at what those around us are doing, or we might procrastinate and not make a decision at all. Um, and even once we've decided what we want to do, there's plenty that can still get in the way of us following through. Um, so there may be small barriers that lead to procrastination or giving up along the way, um, or we might be impacted by seeing what everyone around us is doing and change our minds. Um, and so the process of following through actually also greatly impacts the outcome. So ultimately, the path from decisions to actions um, and ultimately to outcomes looks a bit more like this. Um, but understanding the contextual clues and shortcuts that impact us is the key to behavioral science. And when we understand how they affect our actions, we can design to mitigate them or even to use them for good. So what we know from behavioral science is that people don't always act the way that we expect they would. Um, but luckily, years of research have provided us with tools to predict how humans behave. Um, and what we know is that human behavior is highly dependent on our human psychology and how that interacts with the context in which we're living or making decisions. So what do we mean by the context? Um, all of these are examples of different contexts in which we're making decisions and taking actions every day. Um, so context might refer to the social, the social context, what those around us are doing. Um, we also know that how choices are presented to us affects how we view them. Um, and even things like our mood or the time of day have been shown to impact behavior. Um, and context can also relate to the experience of poverty, which is the context of living in chronic scarcity. And this is particularly relevant for economic inclusion programming as people living in poverty are exactly those that these programs aim to reach. 
So chronic scarcity is an experience that can exacerbate human tendencies such as present bias at the expense of longer term planning. So I'll try here to summarize 10 plus years of the research on scarcity in just three bullets. Um, but firstly, scarcity taxes our bandwidth or our cognitive capacity. So one thing that happens when we're experiencing scarcity of any resource is tunneling. Um, so not having enough of one key resource causes the human brain to fixate or focus on whatever resource it is we're lacking. And in the short term, this actually isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, think of, for example, the last time you had a report due for work. Um, in the weeks before, you may have put it off for other things, but in the days before it was due, when time became scarce, um, maybe you were able to focus on it and push other things out of your mind to get it done. However, when it's chronic, scarcity can lead to negative effects. So when one is focusing on only one resource for an extended period of time, they're unable to focus on other key important things. Um, and in the context of poverty, that often includes not having the mental, the mental bandwidth for future or longer term planning. Um, and this is how behavioral scientists have come to view poverty differently. So I'll turn now to get a bit more specific about how and where behavioral science is relevant in economic inclusion programming. Um, and so many of you may recognize this figure as the delivery chain for programs. Um, and throughout the delivery of economic inclusion programs, there are actually multiple places where the success of programs relies on the decisions and actions of program participants. Um, so people may have to decide if they're interested in the program, then they may have to follow through with enrolling. Um, we know that these programs are often a big push of coordinated interventions. So people may need to learn about how to participate in all of the different components and ultimately follow through. And then when people have to use the benefits, they may have to decide to invest and actually follow through. They may have to attend trainings and then apply those trainings in their day-to-day -day lives. Or they may, for example, have to decide to participate and follow through with participating in a savings group. Um, but there are many features of the context that may create behavioral barriers to optimal participation. Um, and in addition, chronic scarcity can deplete just the mental bandwidth that participants might need to fully engage in all of the different aspects of these big push programming, these big push programs, um, as well as exacerbate other behavioral barriers that might exist. Um, for example, when deciding to register, social norms or what they see others doing might be at play. Um, hassle factors can also be a barrier, such as having to open new accounts to join savings groups that they're not familiar with. Um, and ultimately, when they receive benefits or trainings, recipients might tunnel or focus only what they need immediately um, at the expense of longer term planning. Or they may be influenced by how they see others using the cash or the training around them. Um, but the good news is that behavioral science also offers solutions to mitigate some of these barriers. Um, for example, showing examples of participants saving or investing can put people in the mindset of preparing to use the program to build their assets and income. Um, streamlining enrollment processes as much as possible can reduce hassles. Providing clear communication about the full scope of interventions and their timing can help prepare participants to use all of the interventions optimally. Um, and one channel in particular, in particular, um, in particular with cash or asset transfers, um, is that this provision of those benefits um, actually may provide a moment of alleviation of the scarcity that they are dealing with. Um, it may provide a moment when participants have the resources that they need to meet their needs. Um, and that can potentially be a good time to prompt them and support them um, in thinking and planning towards future goals. So finally, um, I'll close with some key learnings and where we see this work going next. Um, so firstly, understanding the context and diagnosing the key bottlenecks is crucial to incorporating impactful designs. Secondly, we've learned that engaging early is important. Um, building behavioral science in when designing the full suite of interventions for big push programming is optimal. Um, and this may sometimes include a subtractive approach or making sure that we reduce any hassles or redundant extra steps. Um, and finally, behavioral designs can have a high impact at low cost. 
And some of the future directions that we are looking into as well um, include a focus on service providers. So we've focused a lot on the behaviors of participants, um, but the behaviors of coaches and trainers um, also have a big impact on how impactful the program is. Um, and in addition, routinely and systematically assessing cost effectiveness may be able to help policymakers and program designers um, to tailor programs to help them achieve the best value for money. Um, and so thank you very much. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'll stop here and I look forward to hearing from all of the panelists. Thanks. Thank you, Kate, uh, for a very comprehensive view of uh, what behavioral science entails and the relevance that it has to the economic inclusion programs. So let's move uh, immediately to our main program now having the set uh, already uh, defined by Kate. So we will have three uh, panelists and then a discussant for the three panelists, but we will have the uh, opportunity to make at least one or two questions to each panelist right after their presentation. So please use the chat box to uh, put your questions so I can translate those to uh, the panelists. We have uh, three uh, very interesting presentations uh, and I will introduce the, the three panelists and our discussant right away so, they, so then we can move straight to uh, their presentations. Our first panelist is Michele Sini. He's a senior economist at the World Bank, and he will present the, experience, uh, the experiences in testing and evaluation behavioral nudges in Tanzania under uh, a very interesting program. Uh, next, we will have Anandi Mani, a professor of behavioral economics and public policy at the Babat School of Government at the University of Oxford, who will share insight from her research in behavioral economics with a focus on poverty and social exclusion context. And our third panelist will be Desmond Daumetu, a productive inclusion specialist at the Ghana Productive Safety Net Project, who will uh, share with us the lessons working in, in that uh, great program in Ghana. And finally, we will have uh, Shagato Data, Managing Di Director of Ideas42, who will reflect on the speaker's experience and define the future directions for the field as uh, the main discussion of this great panel. After that, we will have some time for question and answers for the whole panel. So please uh, put your questions in the chat box. So with uh, no further delay, uh, Michele, please. Go ahead for eight minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Carolina. And thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you to the PI team for inviting me. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and then I'm going to switch off the video, if that's OK, and just uh, want to introduce myself to save bandwidth. Um, so as Carolina mentioned, uh, I will uh, briefly talk about um, the experience uh, that we've had uh, in testing and uh, evaluating some behavioral nudges in Tanzania. Uh, this is work that uh, Ideas42, uh, with the support of the World Bank uh, um, and in collaboration, obviously, with uh, the Tanzania Social Action Fund, which is the main implementing agency of the Social Safety Net Program in Tanzania, has been carried out. Uh, and um, it's been uh, in the making for the last uh, couple of years. So um, let me give you some uh, background first uh, on, uh, on, the, um, on the program. So uh, the nudges were tested under the umbrella of the Productive uh, Social Safety Net Program, which is the flagship social assistance program in Tanzania uh, that obviously has the main objective of improving the access to uh, income earning opportunities and uh, services for extremely poor households in Tanzania. Uh, and at the same time, it hopes to enhance the human capital of the children. To give you a quick timeline of the program, um, uh, this is uh, a nationwide uh, social assistance program, as I said, it's been uh, in the making for the last uh, 12, 13 years. It was piloted uh, beginning in 2009. It was um, in just three districts and gradually was scaled up. 
and by 2015, it actually reached uh, over a million households in about 70% 70 of the villages in Tanzania. And uh, right now, uh, we are in the second phase of the program, and we just completed a mass expansion of the program to another 400,000 households and all the remaining villages in the country. So, as I said, this is a, uh, the, the flagship social assistance program in the country and covers every single village in Tanzania. Here you can see the basic building blocks of the program. Um, so this is a very comprehensive program. Um, it targets uh, extremely poor households and those households at risk of falling into extreme poverty. Right now we cover approximately 10% of the Tanzanian population, which is uh, 1.3 ha million households, as I said, and about 5 million uh, people. Uh, it has three main components, uh, a cash transfer component, uh, which is either conditional or unconditional, depending on whether or not the household has labor capacity or not. Um, it then um, uh, has a public works component for selected household members that are work able and of working age. And last but not least, we have uh, the livelihood enhancement uh, measures, which uh, are also known as a productive inclusion. Uh, measures that uh, include a basic package, which um, typically uh, includes savings promotion and uh, training in financial literacy, community sessions on the use of nutrition and so on and so forth, and an enhanced package, uh, which actually covers uh, training, uh, mentorship, uh, the assistance in the preparation of a, a, a simple business plan, and then a, a one-off grant to set up um, uh, an actual uh, small business or a, uh, or a micro enterprise. Now, uh, what is the problem that we try to address by incorporating behavioral nudges into this program? Um, we knew that PSSM beneficiaries, because of their, um, uh, their status as extremely poor households, were having problem um, both uh, spending uh, their cash um, optimally in the sense that they were not saving as much as they would have liked and they uh, could not uh, invest as uh, much as they wanted. So we visited about four districts and nine communities and we started talking to them and we discovered that essentially uh, there was a number of constraints to beneficiaries actually saving as much as they wanted. Uh, first thing uh, we discovered, well, we suspected so, but the beneficiaries confirmed that same things are, are a, a private matter. So typically you see how much households consume. Uh, people would go to the markets with their friends, uh, with the family members, and they see the consumption patterns of, of neighbors and uh, fellow community members, but they don't know how much people save, and they tend to suspect that people don't save a lot. So that kind of anchors already their, their behavior. Um, at the same time, of course, because uh, the target of uh, the BSM program is extremely poor households, of course, these households have always a lot of competing priorities and typically tend to uh, focus on the most pressing needs. So, um, of course, they, um, they, um, they always have uh, issues coming up and it's very difficult for them to plan for the future and to follow up uh, on those plans. At the same time, obviously having savings in the house means having cash in the house. And, and of course, in small communities, this, this can also lead to, um, uh, to the risk of theft, which is obviously a very real uh, threat. So obviously people don't like uh, to keep uh, cash in the house and therefore don't save as much as they, uh, they can. Um, so at the same time, going back to what Kate was mentioning before about uh, uh, living in a context of extreme scarcity, uh, these households tend to have no money, no access to financial institutions. Uh, very, very few of them have mobile, ban mobile banking. And of course, uh, they live in a um, constant state of stress because of their um, the, the, the poverty in which they um, live in. So um, it's very difficult, as I said, for them to plan and to then follow up with those plans if they wanted to actually save and invest the money uh, optimally. Now, what did we try and do again, uh, the Ideas42 team in, in collaboration with the Tanzanian Social Action Fund, what did we do? We uh, tried, we piloted the use of some nudges uh, in about, for about 900 beneficiaries in uh, eight villages. Uh, and we did a follow-up survey about six, seven weeks after the, um, the uh, introduction of these nudges. 
So the, interv the interventions were basically a, a number of light touch um, tools to uh, try to enhance outcomes around three different um, stages. The moment at which uh, people form an intention and they form objectives, or now they would like to uh, spend their, um, their money. The moment uh, when households make plans and how to uh, follow um, uh, through on this plan. So that would be the third stage. So making, having an intention, making a plan, and then following up on that plan. And the way in which we tweak the program was essentially try and introduce in a number of ways, but here you can see some practical examples. And I know someone in the chat was asking how you actually design these type of interventions. Well, this is uh, what we actually did in Tanzania. We introduced some cards with uh, images, for instance, representing uh, positive identities, values, and skills that beneficiaries may possess. And we started displaying them at, pain points, uh, at payment points so that uh, beneficiaries were guided to essentially start thinking about their positive attributes. And then they, um, they were asked to actually pinpoint the particular image that best described their positive uh, characteristics or attributes. Um, so um, we basically then display these post posters at, at payment sites or community uh, gatherings to then show examples to the fellow beneficiaries of how uh, different people may have different productive goals. Um, at the same time, beneficiaries were presented with uh, sticker images of, of saving goals options, and um, uh, they were asked to draw different goals in a blank sticker uh, and then sort of come up with their own uh, individual plans and goals. So you can see here the different cards that, um, that we used in the, in the, in the Tanzanian example. You can Michele, see you have one that. minute left. Perfect, okay. yes. Um, the, the, um, again, we, we tried to uh, also um, um, uh, introduce some, some slides just to uh, give them a card with, with uh, uh, giving the abilities of beneficiary to, to actually set their saving goals and write down the design, the timelines for achieving these goals. Um, and last but not least, we actually gave them a savings pouch, uh, which is essentially a very simple wallet with two pockets with um, uh, allowing people to partition the cash that they got so that they could at least try and follow through with the plan that they had. Um, now, results. Um, this was a randomized controlled trial, and this is very briefly the results that we achieved. Um, and we uh, basically saw very good results. Uh, first, we saw that uh, people did save more. Um, there was uh, an increase in saving inc incidence of about 13%. Uh, there was um, uh, uh, an improvement in the intention uh, in, uh, of people. So basically the way in which people reported having a productive goal for the money that they received. And at the same time, we saw marginally uh, significant increase in actually people carrying out productive investments with the money that they received. So all in all, a very positive experience. And just to conclude, this is now what we're chatting with, what we're um, um, uh, sort of um, struggling with, but it's, um, uh, I'm sure that we can, we can achieve what we've set out to do. So COVID obviously made it, um, uh, put us in a situation where the implementing agency had very uh, many competing priorities. And of course, these ancillary measures uh, sort of um, were put uh, uh, on the side a little bit. So we, we struggled to get um, uh, implementing agencies focus on, on these very simple and cheap tweaks to a program that can actually achieve a lot relative to uh, their cost that they have and their, um, their administrative ease with which they can be implemented. Nevertheless, um, the experience in Tanzania was very positive. We're now completing a second phase of the pilot, which is slightly larger with some further tweaks in the design, but the main idea is that we plan to scale up uh, these nudges uh, for the program nationwide uh, to actually uh, increase the um, ability to save and to invest among uh, beneficiaries. So with that, thank you so much for the attention and I thank will you. answer any question that comes up. Thank you, Michele. Uh, three very quick questions that come from our audience. Uh, first, if um, this is a version, a new intervention of the ultra poor BRAC graduation 
program style and if it is what what is different and what is similar to the experience in in bangladesh and if it is uh, some sort of graduation program brac style uh, how do you plan to ensure the financing to ensure we reach this stage of graduation the second question has to do with with what are the needs uh, of changing the mindset of the managers, the coaches, the trainees, the, the people working in, in, the, in the project uh, to be able to adopt these nudges and to, use, and to make them work actually. And there's a very interesting question that I think we should ask to all of our participants. If you have um, one example of something that went wrong <laughs> with the nudge, that was very nicely designed and then in the implementation it didn't uh, work through. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to answer those. Sure. Um, thank you. So the, the first question, um, I, I'm not clear if the question is about whether this actual what I presented, so the tweets introduced, I'm not, uh, I'm not clear if they're no, asking the general, these tweets the are general, correct. No, if the okay, general so, initiative is based on the Ulfapur graduation style programs, uh, um, based I, designed on that experience. I mean, I so I don't think it, so. The PSSM program is a uh, an intervention that bundles, as I said, many different uh, policy tools: cash transfers, public works, and productive inclusion. Uh, measures which range from uh, savings promotion to community sessions to uh, grants to trainings and so on and so forth. So the idea is that receiving these three sets of, of subsequent and coordinated measures, um, a family uh, should be able to uh, um, to be in a in a better place at the end of the program. So at the end of the three year cycle, the idea is, of course, for these families to be able to graduate from the program and no longer have to rely on social assistance. So in that sense, yes, this is this is a graduation program. Um, I think that that's pretty much the objective of any uh, social assistance program that combines uh, cash transfers and, and productive inclusion uh, measures. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess, yes, it's it's uh, it, the spirit is very similar to the BRAC graduation model. Um, the nudges themselves, they're not, I mean, it's something that we tried specifically inside the program, but um, um, it's um, so that they, they still fall within the graduation uh, framework, of course. Uh, I don't think we, uh, we, um, uh, we set out to, let's say, copy BRAC, but I think by now the, the, the graduation model that obviously BRAC piloted in Bangladesh is become quite ubiquitous around the world for, for social assistance programs with productive inclusion measures. Um, on the question of training, so I think that was actually pretty straightforward because as I hope I, I, I tried to describe, these, these nudges were actually extremely simple to implement. We're literally talking about uh, posters and um, a savings pouch and just trying to, well, nudge people towards doing uh, taking actions and making plans and following through those plans uh, in, in their own interest. So um, obviously the Ideas 42 uh, team was there all along with TASAF. TASAF has a long tradition in implementing these type of programs. So there was some training uh, at um, sort of at the, at the macro level to, uh, to make sure that the implementers understood what we were trying to do. But at the local level, the training was actually quite minimal. As I said, we were talking about fairly simple um, tools to implement. Um, and the last question about what went wrong. Um, I, I mean, I, I honestly, I think the biggest issue that we, we faced uh, is, was somewhat exogenous and it was really the, um, the, the, the pandemic that um, uh, basically took away attention from these type of ancillary measures and forced governments to focus on the bread and butter of this program, which is really cash distribution. So I, I would think that uh, the main challenge that we've had is managing to keep this moving and on track and uh, to give, to make sure that the government and the government agency gave the deserved attention to these small tweaks, which as I said, for the cost that they uh, entail actually can achieve uh, a lot. So, 
I don't think anything went wrong per se, sort of at the community level in terms of uh, sort of having unintended consequences and so on and so forth. But I think the pandemic definitely derailed a little bit the efforts that we were making in, in these, uh, as I said, ancillary uh, productive inclusion measures um, uh, that sort of surround uh, social well cash transfer programs. Thank you, Michele. That was great. Uh, very uh, specific question. Who got the cash transfer in the household? You're muted, uh, Michele. Sorry. To the extent possible, it was the women, the program rules state that the woman in charge of the household finances receives the payment. And this leads to a situation in which 80 83% of the direct beneficiaries of PSSN are actually women right now. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, thank you, Michele. We'll, we will come back to you after the uh, discussion uh, for more questions. Uh, so now we could move uh, to our next uh, panelist, Anandi. Uh, we'll go now from a very specific case to uh, policy recommendations. Please, Anandi, the floor is yours. Great. Um, thank you for being uh, here. I'm going to talk about a uh, study that we have just uh, analyzed the data for, although I have to say that uh, we did the work on this uh, a few years ago. Uh, so let me start by uh, sharing the screen and, and thank you all for coming here. And um, I guess this is at some level a very sort of policy oriented project. So this is the first time I'm presenting it. And I guess this is the right kind of audience to get feedback from. So thank you to you all for being here. And let me share my screen now, um, just a second. Um, is this clear to everybody? Can you see the screen? Yeah, perfect. Go ahead. Fantastic. Um, thank you. So uh, this is a, a joint work with uh, Paul Niehaus and Sendil Mulainathan and Carolina Kansikas. Um, and this is a project that we did in Kenya. We start with a little bit of background. Um, um, so as we've all been talking, cash transfers are a very staple tool of economic inclusion programs. Uh, but um, the question that we approached this project was, is there anything given how staple this tool is that we can do to improve the design of cash transfers, uh, specifically in terms of the timing of the transfers? And uh, I say dosage, meaning how large the transfers are. And you know, I think this is still an uh, open question. And the, uh, I hope that I will uh, persuade you that the evidence that I uh, present to you today suggests that there, are, there is room for some concrete design improvements, uh, which can then um, also on some behavioral nudges, which will help participants make better choices in terms of the cash transfer use. Um, so so the, the first question I uh, want to pose to you, and this is just sort of, you know, we were in understanding mode here, was, is the structure of cash transfers, is it aligned well with what the program beneficiaries want or what's, what, where their interests are? Um, and as we know, you know, especially in a lot of the uh, target population, the agricultural populations, rural populations, incomes vary both predictably because for seasonality reasons, but also unpredictably. And the needs for cash vary because, you know, there are sudden needs which show up if, you know, somebody falls unwell, or there may be needs which show up, but they're lumpy and they're predictably happen. Like for example, school fees in January was something in our setting. Um, and then, uh, you know, there aren't always the tools available to manage the mismatch between the income flow and the expenditure flow. Um, and as we know from uh, this very nice uh, study by uh, Daryl Collins and co-authors, uh, the book called Portfolios of the Poor, there is, you know, having these tools and juggling these tools is a real challenge. And uh, more recently, um, another uh, bunch of studies have looked at this issue of seasonality and how 
uh, that creates challenges. For example, more money is needed during the lean season. This is a study by Garad Bryan and co-authors from Bangladesh. Um, uh, there is also demand for what I'm calling lumpiness, which is you don't want steady little bits of money. Sometimes you need a chunk of money. Um, you know, so there is evidence from the, the, the studies that um, uh, Collins and co-authors did, as well as last year from the American Economic Review, uh, this paper, uh, uh, with a, which is a study in Malawi, which also found the same. And from the work that Claire Balboni and Oriana Bandiera, Mohitrish Kotak and others have done uh, with the graduation programs in, <clears throat> excuse me, in Bangladesh, they have shown that the timing of the investments and the lumpiness are really crucial to help people um, escape poverty traps. And so that's sort of the background with which we came to uh, eliciting uh, our uh, recipients' preferences in terms of how and when they wanted the money. And so what is the evidence we found here in terms of uh, what they responded to us in terms of the uh, preference? Um, so this is a study that we did with an unconditional cash transfer, I should clarify. And this is with an NGO that many of you may be aware of. It's called Give Directly, which gives uh, one time but very large transfers in, in uh, uh, Kenya and also Uganda now. Um, and they have some very simple eligibility criteria. For instance, whether a family has a grass thatched roof or not, and they use satellite images to actually figure that out uh, before they send their staff to verify the uh, socioeconomic status of the household. And uh, typically participants in this group, whom we uh, used as our uh, respondents for our study, they receive a, a $1,000 uh, one-time transfer. And uh, a couple of key things here, which are important to note, is that this money is received by mobile payment. So it's the M-Pesa system in Kenya. And what um, the Give Directly does is that they split the transfer into two bits. So they give an initial token transfer ensure that everybody's mobile account is working smoothly, and then they transfer the rest of the money, which is the uh, remaining $965. So in our study, we were focused on three aspects of the design. One is about the timing of when people get the transfers. The second is about the number of installments or tranches in which they receive the money. And the third thing was uh, something that I will talk about in a few slides, which is, uh, you know, given that we are aware of the scarcity context that Kate very nicely explained, um, and that is likely to be relevant because our recipients here are very poor, how can we use a behavioral choice architecture in a way that we nudge them towards making better decisions? So those are the three issues we were focused on. So in terms of what participants told us they wanted, uh, the one big finding that we had very clearly was that, you know, the most dominant way in which cash transfers are given to people worldwide, which is that people get small amounts of money and they get them at very regular, uh, specifically monthly intervals. What we found is when we offered people four options, uh, which is uh, 12 monthly transfers, or, um, you know, uh, four uh, transfers, which would be, uh, uh, you know, quarterly transfers, basically, or split the transfer into two and give it in two installments, or give it all entirely as one single lump sum transfer. When we presented these four options, as you can see from this picture on the right, the one that people least preferred was the one that is the most commonly used system which is you know, giving people monthly transfers. Everybody, uh, sorry, uh, tended to rank the uh, monthly transfer uh, thing the lowest. And, and mostly people preferred much lumpier transfers. As you can see from here, they preferred either single or uh, two tranches much more. And this was for a bunch of reasons. Uh, you know, people, some people didn't want uh, a single transfer, they wanted two because they were worried that they would misuse the money. Some people had cash flow reasons in terms of when it was lean, it's not, and so on. But definitely not the single uh, monthly transfer. That's not what people wanted. Um, and then the other interesting thing we found was that even though 70, about 70% 70 of people pretty much wanted the money as soon as they could get it, we still had about 30% of people who said like, you know, who didn't want the money immediately over the next 12 months when we were making it available to them. In fact, you can see here that among the 30%, about 40% of them wanted, uh, you know, uh, there was a little bit of a delay 
Uh, some people wanted uh, the, the two tranches about uh, uh, you know, uh, two months, 20% uh, of them wanted the, it, it later and so on. And so, um, and when we asked them, why do you want the money later? Some of them said that they have difficulty saving. Uh, some of them talked about self-control issues. Um, and so they wanted the delay and using it as a commitment device. Some people said that you know they want to use it for I don't know building a house and they want to do it right after or, uh, you know uh, the the harvest and so on. So there were a bunch of reasons, but the bottom line is that people were actually surprisingly willing to wait, even though uh, this was not something they were doing as regularly. And you would have thought that many people will grab the first uh, day they can take the money, but that's not what people were doing. Which was Randy, also you have one more minute. Um, and then um, what we find is that people choosing this delay transfers actually were sensible because when we did a survey about one and a half years after the uh, money first became available, we found that people who took the transfer more delayed were actually uh, deliberating and thinking more about how to use the money. Uh, they, it also made them uh, have higher income. Um, and um, so the question uh, we uh, were faced with was, how do we get them to make these better decisions? And here, what we did was, when we elicited their preferences uh, about you know, uh, when they wanted the money and then how many installments, we had done a little bit of a behavioral intervention there. What we did was that initial $35 token transfer, some people had, uh, when we elicited their preferences, they had got that money four weeks ago. And another group, which I'm calling late, had got the money just four days ago. So the ones who had just got it four days ago had a little more cash left, typically about four to six dollars only actually out of the 35, but they had a little more money. And what we, very interestingly, what we found was that the people who had that just that four to six dollars more cash on hand, they were much more willing to wait longer to delay their, uh, their bigger transfer, their main transfer. And as I showed you from our other uh, end line data, we find that delay was actually beneficial to these people because it aligned much better with the lean season. And it's not that other people who, who wanted the money earlier weren't aware of the seasonality, but somehow the people who had the uh, $4 extra cash on hand, when they were making these decisions and thinking about them, we have some suggestive evidence that they had a little more mental bandwidth. And so they were making more sensible choices and being more thoughtful about when they wanted the money. So um, the big takeaways I want to uh, leave you with is that firstly, monthly transfers, which is the most common form, does not seem to be what people want. Um, the second big factor here is that seasonality in rural agriculture is um, something that we really need to take into account in terms of how we time the cash transfers as well as the installments, because this is a predictable source of variation and giving people the money in the lean season really seems to help them uh, raise more income from it. Uh, the third thing is that how can we get people to make better decisions which are beneficial to them uh, here the choice architecture can really be used. And as I showed you in our evidence, just having a, just four to six dollars more when they are thinking about uh, when they want the bigger transfer makes them think more carefully. It increases their patience and that pays off in the long run because it then leaves them with higher income, uh, higher, uh, you know, more deliberation in how they use the money and actually increases their land value. So bottom line, I would say, it's better to help the poor before they become too poor because it, you know, this seems to give them more bandwidth and uh, makes them, uh, uh, nudges them towards better choices, financial choices. And cash transfers, which are better aligned with the seasonal needs of the poor, can really help improve their income, uh, their asset accumulation, and their deliberation, uh, which are all core objectives of economic inclusion programming. Um, I'll stop there and uh, take questions. Thank you, Anandi. We are running a bit late uh, in the yes, program and, and there are many questions asked and, and being answered in the chat box. So I will make just one question for you and is uh, how uh, would you imagine uh, Nudge to allow governments or program designers within governments to change 
and adapt the number of payments they are using in, in their cash transfer programs to be sensitive to your results? Yeah, so I think that's a very fair question. Um, I think that, um, so, you know, this is the first, uh, there are now a few uh, studies which are generating this kind of evidence on the impacts of seasonality. I, mean, I have seen about two or three uh, by now. I think that, uh, I, I hope that one important way to persuade governments firstly is to show them robust evidence from a bunch of different settings. I think that's the first thing. It is very intuitive. Uh, but I think the second thing there would be that we are able to uh, also show them how big these gains are. Um, and then we would have to um, sort of help them plan around uh, sort of changing the uh, sort of their financial planning so that they can plan around these things, you know, in terms of lean versus the, uh, the non-lean season. Um, and I think, you know, for example, the Malawi study, which I referred to, it shows that even for people who get regular payments, they are actually willing to defer payment in some months. So, you know, governments could be persuaded to do this by saying, look, people, rather than give them payment in January, February, uh, March, if you give it to them uh, for three months in April, they are willing to take it later. So I think that governments can be persuaded by saying that there are periods where you don't don't have to spend at all and then you spend later so I think it's not that we're asking them to spend more we're just asking them to make it lumpier and time it right so if we can say that it's not a higher financial outlay but it will require more planning hopefully that should persuade people given that there are big income gains to be had from that approach thank you Anandi that's very helpful and I think there are a lot of lessons to be tested here uh, in, in several programs. So we will come back to you after the discussion. Uh, let's move to Ghana. Desmond, please go ahead. The floor is yours and tell us about uh, the program you're working in. Hello. Yeah. Good afternoon from Ghana. Um, my name is Desmond. And um, as you rightly said, I'll be sharing our experiences with the rest of the team, what we have, the work we've been doing in relation to productive inclusion as it relates to, um, hello, hello? Yes, we're hearing you loud and clear. Go ahead, please. Okay, so fine, yeah. So um, I'll start off first by sharing a bit of background so that we're able to contextualize the discussion. Well, for us in Ghana, we are barely new to this whole idea of uh, applying um, behavioral science to economic intervention. Um, we started preparation way back, but it was not until December of last year that we launched. So I would like to share what we have been able to do to date and how we think we can profit from behavioral science and also share with the rest of the colleagues on the call what lessons we have picked and what the mind thoughts are that must be observed. So a bit of background information on our program. It's a Ghana Productive Safety Net program within which we are implementing a productive inclusion um, scheme that is aimed at increasing access to income and an opportunity for poor households. The funding is currently 6 million, but we are grateful to the World Bank. We have 50 more million dollars to implement this within the next four years. And we're currently working in 43 districts as service as a local government authority. We are spread across 331 communities and reaching, currently reaching 21,500 beneficiaries. In terms of female representation, we have 71%. And for the scope of interventions, I'll to move on to the next slide, just to walk you through what our bundle looks like. First of all, we start off by, by selecting communities. Then we help these communities and beneficiaries to come up with viable enterprise activities that would help them poverty. Then subsequently, they are, the households are allowed to select. After which they are helped select income generating activities of their choice. Then they are taken through um, a very detailed regime of training, taking them through life skills training, business management training, and then micro enterprise training, which focuses on helping them to perfect their art in processing raw materials into final products. Well, there is a big item for us, which is coaching and mentoring, which helps to ensure sustainability 
of the interventions that every beneficiary selects. And this has to do mostly with helping them to improve production marketing and of course, helping them also to um, save for future for the future. Now, these are some of the activities that we uh, prioritize based on beneficiary choices, choices. And I mean, the wide range. Currently, we are implementing 18 income generating activities across the country. And this include both on farm and off farm um, income generating activities. Now, to go to what we are currently doing in relation to our experience with behavioral science. Well, we are working with uh, Ideas 42 and we are currently testing some nudges on helping beneficiaries to save and also in, save so that they can invest in their income generating activities. That is to ensure that they grow their investments. The sample size we have selected is 104, 54, 52 treatment and 52 control. Like I indicated earlier, we barely launched. We launched between December and um, January of this year. And we have given ourselves six months I mean, to carry out an online survey to see what results we get. Um, some initial lessons that we have learned, um, it's important for us to draw attention to this, that um, it is good that um, we have doing this because from implementation, we've realized that um, most of the challenges that most of these beneficiaries have have to do with behavioral traits. So we think it is important, it's relevant that we test behavioral science on the key aspects that would impact project outcomes. And in our, de in our design as a pilot, we took a, it was good, we took account of the environmental and social cultural context, and this for us has helped for us to launch from. For instance, I recall the earlier presenters touching on the nudges and how it goes to affect results. For us, very early in the day, we realized that um, we needed to customize this to fit into the social and economic context of the cultural context of beneficiaries. For instance, we had to call for the change in some of the tools and the nudges that beneficiaries could easily relate to. So I think that it is a major one for us that anybody who is interested in doing this must take account of. Then we also think we benefited a lot from using local facilitators and trainers. And this improved learning. And also for us, it, man it helps manage the cost of implementation. And as, as, as in a way, it also helped in ensuring knowledge transfer because just as we have finished the lunch, you would realize that because we use local um, line officers at the various local authorities as facilitators in the field, um, we definitely are going to transfer some, some knowledge so that in the event we want to scale up, it will not come with any challenge. Then of course, for us, we had some initial challenges with getting this to work and getting onto the ground. And it's all because in our part of the world where we are used to, I mean, physical structures and tangibles, um, behavioral science would have to make a compelling case for policy makers, I mean, get attracted to it and buy into it. So we think that it is important. And it's one of the things that we learned very early in the day. Now, one more let me minute, move to um, our reflection. Just okay, let me move to our reflection. Yeah, thank you. So let me move to our reflections on what we think ought to be the case going forward. Well, we think that behavioral science, like you rightly touched it on, we need to focus on the duty bearers and service providers who lead in the training because they themselves would have to understand what the context is to be able to impact knowledge. This specifically for us would be useful in the area of coaching where they would need to know what knowledge to impact on the beneficiaries in coaching. It's also good for us because we think that it would help in unlocking bottlenecks in social accountability and grievance with those processes. Um, we have found out in the field in our implementation that most beneficiaries don't even feel that they're entitled to some of these interventions. So we think that this is an area that behavioral science can help in dealing with. Then of course, in helping to get beneficiaries to change their minds from continuously depending on cash transfers to economic and productive inclusion initiatives is something that we think behavioral science can help with. It's also important for us to consider the role of behavioral science in helping beneficiaries to make informed choices in opting for high yielding income generation activities as against traditional income generation activities 
which may only be popular but may, may be of, offering low returns and may not dent poverty as one would expect. And well, we think that there's also prospect for behavioral science helping to break gender terror stereotypes and helping that every gender is taken into account and is involved in behavioral, sorry, in productive inclusion. Then we think this other one is key that behavioral science can help with. Currently, we find out that most of our beneficiaries, because they are very poor, they tend to display a lot of despondency, lack of self-worth and lack of confidence. And so that in order that we prepare them well to get into the world of work, we think behavioral science can come in handy to help to change this position of the stream pool so that they can be relevant and can maximize their gains in productive and economic inclusion programs. Um, my last slide, if you would indulge me, it's very just quickly. Quick. This yeah, so uh, we think also that it would help in um, deepening inclusion in the most cases because um, we find ourselves in a world where everybody thinks that it's only the able body or those who matter in society that can participate in economic inclusion programs. One last one, I think that where we find it important that behavioral science can help is where we are thinking that. Um, Currently, people tend to confuse economic inclusion programs or be, uh, productive inclusion programs meant for the stream for with our regular um, income generating or enterprise development programs for ordinary, every ordinary person. And we think this is where behavioral science can step in to help in changing people's perceptions and mindsets about economic and productive inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Desmond. Uh, I will make just a... Uh, use of the time for the question and answer with your case, asking you to uh, maybe go over the specific nudges you are using in, in this pilot and what type of, um, also uh, we would like to know what type of financial training are you providing as part of the, the training issues? Uh, so people have a very clear idea what is really you are testing here uh, in, in more specific terms. Okay, just quickly. I think in the area of financial training, uh, we are helping them to acquire habits of savings because these are persons who are used to taking their cash for consumption and um, without any savings at all. So we help them to say, we help them to um, acquire the habit of savings. And this we are promoting on our own to village savings and loans associations. And we are also helping them to make informed investment decisions i.e. Um, investing in um, a household asset service into an activity or income earning opportunity that would bring regular and reasonable income to the household. Because currently we find most beneficiaries investing in assets as against um, investing in um, activities that would bring some income to the household. Okay, thank you, Desmond. We will come back with more questions in the final uh, round of question and answers. And let's move to our discussant to uh, have some insights of how these three presentations really bring us some evidence of the potential and the role that uh, behavioral insights are, are playing. Desmond, is you? Should I go ahead? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. I will try to be brief. I know that there's lots of questions that people have. And I think um, just briefly, I think we saw both a very interesting um, kind of framework that Kate presented for thinking about why behavioral science or thinking about behavioral interventions might be useful in economic inclusion programming. And then three, um, examples of how things are actually being applied in the context of existing programs. Um, but I think the three presentations that really helped us to see different aspects and different ways of testing behavioral interventions. So, um, you, know, uh, you know, Kate introduced us to this very useful um, sort of framework around cognitive scarcity. 
um, and how that affects people's decision making. And we were then able to see in Michele's presentation about the Tanzanian Productive Safety Nets program um, that it is possible to design these very light touch interventions that respond to specific constraints that beneficiaries may face in this case around saving and investment. And I think I found it really helpful to see both what the interventions looked like. I think hopefully people in the audience also, you know, we, we talk often about nudges and behavioral interventions. It was really useful to see um, what they actually looked like, how they were implemented, but also how they linked back to some of the key concepts around visible social norms and the context of scarcity. Um, and also, of course, the results look very promising. Um, but as Michele pointed out, there are some interesting challenges around scaling. Um, and we'll come to that again, I think, in the rest of the discussion. Now, moving on to Anandi's presentation, I found it absolutely fascinating because I think, as Anandi said, we have this intuition that um, timing may be something that needs to be adjusted and aligned more with people's needs. But um, it's, it's really fantastic to see this work that actually um, you know, elicits these preferences and see what happens when we actually are able to um, perhaps give people different ways of getting the cash that is being provided to them. And so, you know, the findings around the non-trivial demand for delay, I, I, I think was really interesting, as well as the fact that monthly payments uh, or bi-monthly payments, uh, which, you know, pretty much every program that we've worked on has one of those two things, are actually the least popular way for people to um, to get this cash. Now, obviously, this was a pretty large lump sum, and I'd be curious about how this translates into the sort of the smaller sums, but there does seem to be a really important takeaway for programming from here, particularly because we see that actually delaying the payments and making them more lumpy helps people make um, you know, better decisions and actually increases their um, improves their long long-term outcomes. And what I thought was quite compelling was that we know in our experience working with governments that they're always trying, you know, there is, it's always a challenge to get yet another set of payments out every month or every two months. And so I think uh, I would almost even em emphasize even more what Anandi said, which is, you know, if you can go to a government and say, really, it's both better for people in terms of their preferences and better for outcomes, if you have to do fewer payment cycles, but pay the same amount of money, I think this actually holds a lot of promise for um, into, uh, implementing this kind of thing at scale. So I thought this was really fantastic and a lot of food for thought for, for all of us in this space. And from Desmond, we heard about um, a larger test that is currently being implemented around a set of behavioral interventions, again, to increase productive use of cash for saving and investments. And I thought that he provided us with some really useful thoughts, both about um, how things like using local people as facilitators or adapting the nudges to the social and cultural context was really useful, but also I think some um, very solid reflections on the priorities for the future. Um, you know, different parts of the delivery chain, perhaps, that um, behavioral science hasn't been used as much in, um, such as grievance redressal or accountability. And also some of these decisions that people have to make, uh, even about what kind of activity they are going to engage in. And I know that in, in some of our work with other governments, we have looked at the latter a fair bit in terms of really, um, uh, you know, providing a framework within which people can really choose, uh, you know, what's the best use for their cash, what would actually be the most um, productive for them, because as Kate mentioned in the beginning, the provision of the cash or the provision of the benefit itself provides a sort of opening, a window where cognitive scarcity is lessened. And actually that was picked up in Anandi's presentation as well, because the fact that people, uh, the, the late token recipients actually had um, a bit more money on hand meant that they were able to make better decisions. They were more able to engage in this kind of future oriented thinking. So I think all of these are really important areas for the field to focus on, as well as um, a lot of these psychosocial factors that Desmond brought out um, that I, I think haven't been as much of a focus in this literature, which I think has been more focused on some of the logistics as well as some of the kind of key outcomes in terms of the productive use of money. But I think there's a lot that we could all as a community be doing to focus both on different parts of the delivery chain as well as on um, some of these more intangible factors which are nonetheless extremely important um, as the work of you know, Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee and others is shown in the context of BRAC's ultra pro graduation program. So I'll stop there um, and uh, look forward to more questions and more discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Shabrato. Uh, 
I will uh, pose like three types of general questions and allow all you for Hello there. We seem to be having an issue. Maybe Kate can come also sort of answer to this. Yeah, I'm here, but my connection is very unstable now. So, uh, and, and one third area of questions has to do with what's the right amount of the transfers, not only the timing, the amount, and what about uh, the, the sense of security that uh, uh, people have that they will be receiving the next uh, transfer. If it's a monthly one, you have to wait a month, but if it's an annual transfer, maybe that's uh, uh, more difficult to be sure that people is uh, having that security. And the last thing is about public servants, the, the people implementing the programs. And you were saying with this evidence, we could really convince governments to change the way they're doing it. But uh, maybe uh, we could begin thinking about nudges to change attitudes and the culture of public servants also, and, and there's a, a lot of room there. Um, so please, uh, I will invite first uh, in the same order we were uh, presenting. So uh, to answer some of these questions, maybe Kate to begin with for three minutes. Sure, thanks so much. Um, and I know, one of kind of the key things we touched on at the end of the framing presentation was um, future directions and potentially this focus on service providers. Um, so maybe I will start with that. Um, start with that question. Um, but I think when we are kind of as we're thinking about um, this area, we're thinking about what are the barriers that those service providers or coaches or trainers are facing um, that might lead to suboptimal outcomes. Um, and so I think some of the key things that we've been thinking about, um, one is they are also likely facing scarcity, um, which is, I think, often in, in this case is often scarcity of time because coaches may have a large caseload or program implementers uh, may have a lot of different components that they have to deliver. And so this scarcity of time might end up um, causing them to focus on some aspects of the program at the expense of others um, and potentially kind of deliver some of the components of the program suboptimally. Um, so in that case, some of the things that we are thinking about um, is what can we do to simplify any of these complex processes um, that can take the strain off of some of these providers. And in those cases, some of the potential design ideas that we've been thinking about include things like um, using checklists where possible that can help them clearly go through the steps that need to be taken. Um, or wherever possible, automate, automating parts of the process um, so that they're done automatically and the um, service providers have less to worry about. Um, some of the other things that could potentially be at play also include things like social norms and mental models. Um, so for example, in cases where trainers um, complete training with um, other trainers or service providers, um, or, or maybe in cases where they're trained by their peers, um, kind of seeing how they might be influenced by what their peers are doing and how their peers are delivering services. Um, and if there's ever the case that their peers are in a rush um, or facing scarcity, um, that could potentially lead to um, delivering abbreviated services. Um, and then one of the other kind of areas that we've been thinking about as well could be social norms. Um, and providers understanding of what clarity and understanding of what their roles are um, and what they can do to support program participants. Um, so for example, one potential example could be without clear guidance on how to support participants to make decisions on what kind of productive investments they should invest in. 
coaches might rely on their own mental models of what kind of investments people who are living in poverty can or should make, um, which could potentially be limiting and limit participants' choice, participants' ideas of what choices they think they have. Um, so in cases like this, some of the things that we've been thinking about include potentially invent interventions that can fix misperceptions about what behavior, about um, what, what pro service providers think is the norm, um, or potentially addressing these kind of mental models by reframing negative stereotypes that they might have, um, or bringing positive traits or uh, role models from programs to the forefront. Um, these are some of the ideas of things we've been thinking about that might be able to um, address barriers that service providers might face. Thank you, Kate. Uh, sorry for my connection problems, but I put some of the questions in the chat for, for all of you. Uh, Michele, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Carolina. I, I apologize in advance because I, I couldn't hear actually the questions that you posed. So I saw the, the, the brief summary on, on the chat. So I'm hoping that I won't answer just some <laughs> any random <laughs> questions. So, but please stop me if I'm uh, if I'm off topic. So, um, the one question was about gender and social norms. Um, so, I um, I'm aware. That, so, uh, quite a bit of work has been done uh, in this space. Actually, uh, I was just actually quite recently looking at a presentation that uh, uh, the colleagues from the uh, embed team within the World Bank. Uh, shared summarizing some some experience in particular in, in Jordan um, they were trying to obviously uh, try and um, and change the uh, the perception on the norms around the role of women in society uh, for instance whether or not uh, daughters should be allowed to go to school whether women should work outside of the house uh, I'm trying to sort of uh, unpack a little bit the issue of, of perceptions on what the society deems as appropriate or not, and what uh, I should uh, do or not do uh, within the confines of my of my uh, my own family, and I and I think there's been a lot of um, a lot of positive um, uh, work done on this in this space, and I um, I'm happy to try and dig out. Um, in fact, there was recently an event I believe that um, the World Bank put together precisely on the issue of social norms and. Uh, and, um, uh, and behavioral intervention. And I'm happy to try and dig out the uh, tape recording of that, that I'm sure can be found online and I'll put it in the chat. Um, in terms of savings and maybe that was also, Caroline, that was also related to the frequency of payments. Yeah, uh, again, I apologize. Or, or some, th there was a question in the chat saying, well, what happens if we are very successful in promoting savings, but that has a short-term impact in nutrition, child nutrition, for example? Um, uh, so, so yeah, that, uh, honestly, on that one, I, I am not aware of any uh, instance in which uh, beneficiaries of these type of program actually ended up saving too much. I think the, the evidence, and uh, others can correct me if I'm wrong, but the evidence is overwhelmingly telling us that uh, there's a high propensity to, co to consume when it comes to uh, the target of these, uh, of these programs. So um, I would say that, uh, you know, probably between half and 80% of the transfers get, get, um, get spent on uh, basic needs, and then the rest may be saved uh, for, for the future or for a productive investment. So I don't think we're quite there yet where we've been that successful that people oversave. Um, but, um, but maybe more importantly, on the, on the issue of frequency of payments, and I, again, I don't know if the, the question was whether uh, uh, a yearly payment is, is better or worse than a, a, a sort of a, a more frequent and smaller payment. I saw something on the chat about, about that. Um, my personal feeling, but again, I, um, maybe I, you know, people shouldn't call me on that, but I, I sense that the main, uh, the, the most important thing for beneficiaries is actually the, the stability of the payments, the pre predictability of the payments. Yeah. Um, I think as long as people can plan around the payments, um, that's the most important thing. Uh, now, my personal feeling is that yearly is too unfrequent. So I would, I would prefer more frequent payments just because, uh, 
uh, again, there's a lot of competing priorities and I always fear that giving large lump sum of cash um, within a village um, sort of creates tension um, even among those that are uh, better off. Um, and then also sort of it becomes uh, um, a very considerable amount of money to just have on hand when you have a lot of competing priorities and a lot of household members. So I would always go for a smaller benefit uh, more frequently also because it helps people plan and sort of smooth consumption. Um, but again, that's, that's probably more of a personal opinion, but to me, the key is predictability uh, of payments. Um, and on the trainings, I believe that the last person was in trains, and I think I, I, I answered a bit of that in my, okay. in my discussion. I, um, I, in Tanzania, which is what I can speak uh, for, we didn't really see any particulation in terms of training um, staff or implementers when it, come, uh, when it came to these particular issues, but uh, maybe other countries have had different experiences. Okay, thank you, Michele. Uh, now we can move to Desmond for three minutes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Carolina. I think I'll start off first by looking at the question of gender. And uh, to that extent, I'd like to say that, um, especially within our, the context of our programming, um, we see a lot of prospects for behavioral science helping in changing this whole I am question about which genders can do what. Uh, in our part of the world, um, you go into the field and you find out that there are some activities that are designated as, I mean, being re the preserve of a, a certain gender or certain any of the sexes. And um, to this extent, we think that we can use behavioral change science, I mean, to change these perceptions and get people from the other side to, I mean, come up and take up some of these um, income generating activities. A typical one is um, shared butter preparation, if you are very familiar with it. In a field, in a typical rural community, this is a field that is known to be pre the preserve of women. So it is that some men shy away from it. But we think that behavioral science can be employed in helping prospective beneficiaries to appreciate that there is nothing wrong with a man opting to do this so long as it brings some income to the household. Um, and it cuts across most areas of implementation. The other one I'd like to touch on, it's um, the one that had to do with public servants and the, 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 relating to the nudges. And I made that point and I think that uh, it is important that beyond even public servants, even other duty bearers such as service, other service providers or um, trainers or men, call them the mentors or coaches, they must know what these interventions are about and we must give them some treatment to be able to, I mean, execute the attacks to the ex extent that we expect. Most of them don't appreciate that most of these beneficiaries have rights. They don't see them as being entitled to the benefits that they get from these cash transfer programs or the economic inclusion programs. And this is where we think that behavioral science can come in handy to help in um, engendering that change in mindset. Thank you. Thank you, Desmond. And, and finally, Shogato, please. Hi, I'm happy to go, but I saw that Anandi had her hand raised. Anandi, would you like to go? Yeah, I would just like to make a couple of remarks. So firstly, uh, I think I would like to mention in terms of, you know, some of the sort of changing mindsets in this setting is going to come from experience. And um, I do recall that in the original uh, study by Johannes Haushofer and Jeremy Shapiro, where they were looking at the impact of these uh, large uh, $1,000 cash transfers, uh, they had some evidence which showed that in the houses where the women were the ones who were the recipients of the money, that ex post when they looked at the household satisfaction, actually the households where the woman was as assigned as the recipient were happier overall. And that was not just the women, but also also the men. Um, and I'm guessing, if I recall correctly, that's because the money was somehow used better. So that's, I think the experience of what the women can do is, is, uh, can, is something that can uh, uh, play a role here. Um, and um, sorry, I was also wanting to, um, yes. And the other piece of evidence in terms of, um, so, you know, for instance, when uh, these studies which have looked at giving business loans to women versus men, and in many cases, 
uh, the initial studies found that the um, women's businesses were not as profitable and subsequent studies realized that the, the, the women's businesses were not as profitable, typically because a bunch of the money was actually being diverted out of the loan to the husband's business. So uh, what um, another uh, postdoc from Oxford, who is now an assistant professor at uh, Washington University, um, Emma Riley has found is that using mobile money accounts is actually a very good way to ensure that the money which is given to women for their businesses actually stays with women. And she finds that um, the profitability of your businesses then is stays intact and it's no different from that of the men. So I just wanted to sort of share those results. These are not so much around the social norms change, but to the extent that experience uh, of you know, getting women to handle the money makes a difference. It shows that the overall household welfare is higher and maybe that will be something which will uh, persuade people to change their mind. Um, the last thing, and this is something I just want to throw out as an invitation because this is something I have wanted to um, do a study around for a while, which is I would be interested in seeing whether we can uh, leverage cash transfers as a tool by using um, the transfers to the group as a whole if they change their behavior or if enough people in a group change their behavior. And if we make the cash transfer conditional on group outcomes rather than individual outcomes, whether we can then shift the social norms. So I be interested in um, undertaking a study like that if uh, somebody has a context where they think that there will be an appetite for something like that. Thank you, Anandi, and my apologies because I skip you. Uh, very short, Shugato, because we have to go to the uh, poll. I will be very, very brief. I, th I don't think I have a, a lot to add on these excellent reflections, except to say that I think a lot of these um, things that we're looking at in terms of tensions between different kinds of outcomes uh, are something that is very important to keep in mind while designing interventions. And particularly, I think we think about something like the tension between savings and nutrition, we have to be careful that whatever people, you know, that when people are setting goals for their, um, for the cash transfer or for other benefits, we don't artificially restrict them or push them in a particular direction. And we have some evidence from some joint work with the World Bank and the government of Madagascar um, in a setting where actually nutrition and child needs were uh, some of the things that the recipients who were women with young children prioritized. And we saw very um, positive effects on, um, on those outcomes in early childhood development, even though, of course, savings and other kinds of productive uses were among the menu of things that people could consider when thinking about what to do with the outcome. So I do think that it's important there. And I, and I really like Anandi's idea about looking at uh, looking at, you know, whether group norms can change, because, you know, these interventions by themselves, you know, even if they're not explicitly trying to change a norm, are in fact making different kinds of behavior more normative and more visible, and that is a way in which they can engender certain kinds of social change. So I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you all for this great session. Actually, we could uh, have an, an extra hour to go over all the amazing questions posed in the chat and all the discussions that can come after. But we need to close and uh, you will see the uh, questions for the poll. Uh, I would uh, ask you to turn your cameras on also for this last minute so we could see you and um, invite you to the next open house that PI will be organizing and this will be focused on uh, how to accelerate and advance uh, the advancement of women's economic empowerment agenda and will reflect on uh, innovative transformative gender approaches. Uh, it's, it's more than just targeting women or have the social programs target, uh, uh, given directly to women, it's, it's a lot more. So stay tuned for more uh, of this great sessions of the PEI Open House webinar series, and please answer the survey so we could keep improving these uh, sessions. So in this last minute, just to thank you all, and uh, again, apologies for the problems with internet connections, but we are 
some of us outside of big cities. So <laughs> we could, we need to learn how to live with this. Uh, thank you all for being part of this open house session and stay tuned for more with PI. Thank you, bye. Thanks Thank everyone. You Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good day.